at the end, just so everyone knows. Uh, tonight we have, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. Tonight um, we have a man that I think uh, many of you know at this stage. For those of you who don't, we have uh, Rory Hearn. He is a lecturer in social policy in the Department of Applied Social Studies, a Maynooth. He is an expert in housing policy. He teaches postgrad and undergrad on uh, housing rights, inequality, civic engagement, and civil society. He has a recent publications called Housing Shock, the Irish Housing Crisis, and How to Solve It, uh, how, the, the Housing Crisis and How to Solve It. And you may have heard him on multiple platforms talking about the right to housing and talking about uh, our housing crisis and what we should be doing. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna bring Rory in. He's going to uh, speak for a bit and then I'm gonna ask him some questions, but I will also ask that the audience uh, raise their hands to ask any questions or put it in to the chat box and I can read it out. It, it's, it's in fairness, these sessions are quite informal. So if you like to raise your hand, ask your questions yourself, how, um, engage yourself, that would be great as well. So Rory, I'm gonna let you, let you get on. Thanks, Hazel, um, and thanks for the invite to present tonight. And it's great to be here um, and be part of what hopefully and appears to be um, the process towards getting a referendum to put the right to housing in the Constitution. Um, as everyone is aware, the housing crisis is um, a social and economic and, of course, environmental disaster in many ways as well. Um, and we need some positive uh, progress and I think this referendum really offers a potential for that and um, so I just I have a presentation which and I can try share now um, and you have access yeah, yeah yeah I do okay so can you see that okay yeah oh, oh. hello yeah yeah I think yeah I can see it if anyone can see it let me know we're all right, we're business. Yeah. Okay, so just in terms of this, what I wanted to run through, and I know many of you, um, all of you will be very familiar with the situation, but in terms of housing, but I think it is important that we put this, the referendum in context um, of the crisis. And the president referred to it as a social disaster recently, and he was absolutely correct. And I have highlighted this for many years now, um, that it is both a, a social, there's a form of social disaster going on in terms of a generation been locked out of being able to have an affordable, secure home of their own, be that owned or rented. Um, we are seeing emigration um, of younger households due to the lack of the prospect of getting a home in Ireland. And we have unfortunately again an unprecedented scale of homelessness, but it is also having significant economic impacts um, and we've seen the high housing costs means that the state itself is having to pay more and more each year to cover people's rents. Um, and it's also leading to increased poverty and um, the loss of money from the local economies. And we're seeing issues of, you know, schools not being able to access teachers, creches not being able to get childcare workers and a general issue of um, people, uh, businesses, and the public sector struggling to get some key workers and significantly influencing that is the lack of affordable housing. So when we're talking about the right to housing and why this is important, what I argue, and I know many others are, is that we're in a form of structural housing crisis for the last two decades. That is both, as I said, a social um, disaster and it has major economic implications as well. And if we look at, for example, rents, the most recent just out today, the RTB daft, or RTB uh, figures, not daft, sorry. Um, the RTB figures show that the average rent in um, our cities are over doubling um, it since 2013. Um, and this is not a sustainable housing system. And you can see here, um, this is 2007. So this was the Celtic Tiger high of rents. And we can see here, you know, in Dublin, significantly surpassed it, surpassing the Celtic Tiger rents in um, in Cork, in Galway as well. Um, and interesting, Limerick has actually had the highest increase in rent since 2013 in terms of percentage, over 108% increase. Um, and what this shows, of course, is, is, you know, is a housing system 
and in particular for rents, which is completely out of, out of control and not delivering affordable housing. Then we have another issue which links directly to the right to housing, which is the whole issue of uh, evictions going on in the private rental sector. This is RTB uh, figures as well, showing the significant increase in the latter half of last year and this year in terms of notices to quits being issued um, to tenants. And these are over 90% of these are for no fault of the tenant. About two thirds are due to the uh, landlord selling the property. And what's really interesting in these figures, and we can see it, is the impact. 2019, just to explain, is the first time landlords had to register when they were issuing a notice to quit with the RTB. So that's why you see this increase. It's in, in essence, essentially landlords obliging by uh, their legal obligations, becoming aware of them. Um, but then you see this huge collapse in um, of evictions when the eviction ban was introduced during COVID. It was lifted temporarily during the summer of 2020, introduced again. You see this fall again. Um, and of course, at the time as well, we also had falling homelessness. So this is very important because part of the argument for why the eviction ban couldn't be extended beyond the COVID period was the issue of property rights in the Constitution and the property rights of landlords. And this was cited by various ministers at the time that there couldn't be an extension of this eviction ban, even though it was leading to significant falls, most, most significantly in family homelessness, family and child homelessness, but due to the constitutional protection of private property. And so what, what this shows is that had we a right to housing in place in our constitution, it is more likely that government would have been able to extend that ban on evictions if it chose to do so. Um, and I think it's just a direct example of the implications of the right to housing uh, and property rights in our constitution as it's currently constructed. Um, in terms of homelessness, I think that there's something around the issue of, we have accepted homelessness, I think, and normalized it in Ireland now. And it's deeply disturbing that we have and, and for me, it's one of the core arguments why we need a right to housing in our constitution, because I think we've lost our way completely in understanding the and um, taking account of the impact of homelessness and what that means. And in particular on children um, and families. And when you look at homelessness from uh, as an adverse childhood experience, leaving traumatic impacts and potential impacts on a child for their life. Uh, it shows the need to take homelessness, I think, much more serious than we currently are. Um, and this is just a quote from a psychologist around that. And I'm conscious my time is very short. So you can look at these slides uh, yourselves in terms of that. Um, other issues in terms of housing and our situation at the moment is that we've seen the census just came out. It shows that there's 166,000 housing units um, being vacant. And that's not derelict units, that's vacant ones. Um, and this question of how can we have a housing system with this illogical situation, such levels of housing need, and yet such high levels of vacancy and dereliction. So in terms of the referendum and the right to housing, the Housing Commission has launched a public consultation um, on holding the, a referendum on housing. And this is very important that currently the, um, the, the I suppose, the official uh, consultation is not around the right to housing, but is just on a referendum on housing, because that's what the programme for government uh, gives. So what myself and many others, I'm involved in the Home for Good um, NGO Civil Society Alliance, which has Threshold, Focus Ireland, the Mercy Law Centre, um, Simon Communities, and uh, many other civil society organisations working in the area of housing and homelessness, um, we have called for that to be a referendum on the right to housing. And I think the, the um, I think there is growing consensus. And this was shown uh, in the Shannad in the summer when all political parties in the Shannad backed the proposal that there should be a right to housing referendum and um, to insert the right to housing in the constitution. But this consultation is open until the 2nd of September. Um, and I would be encouraging as many people as possible to make a submission um, and I would present a case why I think it should be, as I say, a right to housing, a referendum on the right to housing. As I said, Home for Good has made a, a proposal, which it has presented um, to the Oireachtas committees, various Oireachtas committees, and to the Housing Commission um, conference in May, 
which that there would be a new article put in, Article 43A in the Constitution, whereby the state would recognize and vindicate the right of all to have access to adequate housing. The definition of adequate housing here is drawn directly, that language is drawn directly from the United Nations definition of adequate housing, which sets out, which sets out um, eight or nine different aspects of what that means. It includes affordability, tenure security, uh, habitability, which is quality, um, cultural appropriacy, which would be things like, um, for example, traveler uh, accommodation. And it also includes access, um, which is in terms of uh, housing that's accessible. So there's various aspects of that. And I think that's a very important, that, that phrase and where that comes from and what it means. It gives significant meaning, um, substantive meaning to the right to housing. And then the state having the responsibility um, and the word shall there is very important as our proposal. There's no uh, ambiguity that the state would have the responsibility to work to uh, deliver that right to housing. And in that wording, it's not that the state would have to tomorrow morning deliver uh, and provide a key to a home to everybody. Um, and no one has ever said that that's what the right to housing is about. But it is actually saying that the state has to work essentially to try and achieve and ensure that the housing system delivers these aspects of what is in the adequate housing definition. So I think there are three core reasons why we need a standalone uh, right to housing in the constitution and why it can actually make uh, a contribution. And I, I use the word contribution to solving our housing crisis because putting the right to housing in our constitution will absolutely not solve our housing crisis uh, overnight. Um, and But what it will do is it will make um, a number of important changes um, and I'll explain why, so that it can, as I say, make a contribution to it. The first is that the process of a referendum itself um, is a democratic deliberation about what we as a country feel in relation to issues. In this case, housing, um, this the referendum itself, so holding a referendum, would provide society with that debate that we really, really need about housing. How do we treat housing? How do we understand it? Because fundamentally, we have made a mistake. We've made a mistake for the last two decades in treating housing as a property investment asset rather than what it should be as a home. And our policy has been unclear as to the purpose of housing, and um, whereas a right to housing gives crystal clarity as to what purpose you treat housing as, as its prime. And not just, of course, housing, but everything that goes towards housing, in particular land, the built environment, those key aspects. Um, and in that referendum uh, process, and hopefully that it would pass, it would give a, um, a societal expression, because the constitution is, expresses us, that we would, what we want for housing. And also if it did pass, and hopefully it would, and it, with a significant majority, it would actually give a mandate to the government to take strong action around housing. So it's not just that you put it in the constitution is a positive thing. The process of the referendum itself offers a real opportunity, as I said, to create this societal uh, consensus around how we see housing, but also to create that political public demand and then give the legitimacy for the government to take major action around housing. That's the first reason. The second one is that it would create using the language of the international human rights frameworks, um, this positive and progressive obligation on the Irish state, which means that the Irish state and government would have to look at its policy and practice, sorry, and review how is it meeting the right to housing. So this is really, really important because I actually prioritize, think this is the most important reason for putting the right to housing in the constitution. The issue of the balancing the property rights is an important one, but I actually think this reason of creating this positive progressive obligation on the Irish state so that it can no longer, there can no longer be any ambiguity that the state is responsible uh, for ensuring that things like homelessness, for example, that there's a very clear legal constitutional obligation that the state has to work to address this and um, solve it. And what this would mean, and you can look at this in more detail, is there would be things like policies, for example, housing for all. Uh, the current national policy does not mention the right to housing once. 
if there was a right to housing in our constitution, that policy would have to um, be reviewed to see is it actually meeting the right to housing. And um, there would be a requirement to update our housing strategies to ensure, for example, at local authority levels that all their practice delivers the right to housing as well and operates on the basis of the, of the right to housing. Um, and also around the issue of empowering those whose rights have been violated as well. Um, and ensuring a broader, I think, change. And a lot of the debate around landlords, for example, at the moment, around real estate funds, around developers, a lot of that operators in the housing market act as if they have no responsibility, particularly private actors, when they actually do have a responsibility to ensure the right to housing is fulfilled as well. And that's something that uh, right to housing would achieve. I make the general point that uh, we have the right to primary education in our constitution. Primary education is obviously vital, but safe, secure housing is the most vital of all social uh, and economic rights. A child cannot get an education if it does not have a secure, stable home. Um, and so therefore, I think alongside education, primary education, we should have housing as a basic right in our constitution. Um, and as I explained earlier, the Shannon has passed a motion, cross-party motion, put forward by Mary Fitzpatrick from Fianna Fáil um, that sets out uh, the Home for Good um, wording and that was passed. So I think it is positive to see this cross-party consensus. There was a, 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 a presentation by Home for Good at the Oireachtas Housing Committee um, on the 5th of July and I have a link in here for that uh, um, meeting. It is well worth going through. Um, in terms of discussing and seeing the arguments around the right to housing, the pros and cons for it. Professor Colm O'Caneda, who is a lecturer in uh, law and constitution in uh, UCL, and also a member of the Economic uh, Committee on Social and Cultural Rights as part of the Council of Europe. He is one of the uh, most eminent uh, legal and um, socioeconomic experts on the right to housing. And he sets out in, in, he was also part of the hearing, or not the hearing, the, um, the committee meeting. He set out in it, and I, and I have a number of quotes from him in this, about why a constitutional right to housing would make a difference. And he talks about it, for example, that, you know, why having the right to housing in the constitution would require both the courts to um, assess in terms of uh, cases that come in front of them to balance, for example, property rights with the right to housing, but also the department as well, ministers, they would all be required to assess their policies and what they do in regard to the right to housing. And he makes the point that leaving things as they are in not having a right to housing leaves a void in our constitution. And this is raises issues of, um, the essentially the prioritization of property rights over the right to home, for example. The third one, and this is, goes on to that the constitutional insertion of a right to housing would give clarity, and particularly if it's inserted as a balancing right to the private right to private property, would enable government to be very clear on policies that it brings forward. Um, and again, referring back to, for example, extending the uh, eviction bans and um, the, uh, for example, rent freezes, that there would be much greater clarity for government to enable them to take forward uh, measures on this. And I have a list of these. This is from my paper I submitted to the Housing Commission's um, conference in May, which I have a link for in the presentation. And there's a number of areas where uh, providing a right to housing in the constitution would strengthen government's ability to take action on housing. And the point was made that um, there was at least 10 pieces of legislation brought forward by private members bills over the last six years that were deemed uh, not possible to be brought through the, the doll because they were deemed unconstitutional in relation to housing. Um, and this is part of it. The government can't even bring forward legislation that is potentially unconstitutional. So the issue of not of private property rights being in the constitution and not having a balancing right means there is this chilling effect on bringing forward potential legislation. So potential solutions, as I said, around extending security of tenure for tenants and um, tackling uh, vacancy and dereliction to extension of compulsory purchase orders um, and areas of, for example, standards in the private rental sector, tackling discrimination in housing provision, planning requirements, 
having the right to housing would give government really um, a very clear and unambiguous ability to progress legislation in this area. Um, and the yeah, there's others you can read those. Just in terms of the right to housing and potential uh, for a referendum, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission has done a number of polls in recent years, which showed that an overwhelming majority of the Irish public when polled uh, were in favor of inserting a right to housing in the constitution. Um, and this was, you know, reached 86% against younger people, amongst younger people. Um, and, you know, across all social classes, across the country, uh, there was a majority in favor. It, you know, it, it went down uh, if you, for, in terms of gender, for example, 51% male, 73% female. Uh, social class, there was a difference. The highest social class, it was 57%, still a majority. Um, and then lower social class or economic, social economic groups, a higher percentage. And um, so it does show that there are different views um, within society around this. Um, but I think that there is a very clear uh, majority there who are open to be convinced that this is the right thing to do um, and clearly support it. Now, mobilizing that in a referendum, ensuring those people voted um, and the whole process of a referendum and potential opposition clearly needs to be thought through. Uh, we are likely to see, I imagine, um, those who gain the most from the current housing system, real estate investors, for example, uh, maybe landlords with multiple properties, um, exerting significant pressure and lobbying in this referendum, engaging perhaps in scare tactics um, during the referendum about landlords fleeing the market if such a referendum was, was uh, passed. Um, and we are likely to face significant opposition um, because we know that this is about asserting a different value framework in housing. Um, and that is important. And certain interests will feel that threatens their ability to commodify and financialize housing, which you know this would do. Um, and I think that's important that we are about trying to limit the massive profits that are made from housing unnecessarily um, and that we are about trying to ensure our housing system has, you know, is well balanced in terms of public and private um, provision, but it essentially it provides those aspects of affordable housing, secure housing. Um, and this is about ensuring the state steps up and takes and, and fulfills its responsibility. Um, and, you know, there is, it's not going to solve everything, but it does offer a real, I think, potential. Um, so the, in terms of making submissions, you can go on the Housing Commission website there and make your submission. The link is there in my presentation and the presentations are there as well from myself and Colm and others at that panel six about constitution, constitutionalizing social rights. And you can read those papers there and I think they would be useful in terms of for people making their um, submissions and also Home for Good, which I mentioned the Alliance the Civil Society Alliance, its website will have information as well for people in terms of making submissions. And that uh, joint committee meeting, uh, ROCTUS meeting is there as well, the link. So hopefully that's um, of some use in terms of sparking some discussion and providing some resources for people. Thank you, Rory. I'm gonna ask people questions to put up their hands, I guess. Uh, I want to kick, off, uh, kick it off by saying, well, firstly, the the presentation grave was very informative. I think for my part is that it's not reinventing the wheel. There are other countries that have done this. And the reason why I know from Green Party perspective, we were so eager to make sure it was in the program for government and push for it was that we knew it does work in other countries. So can you bring us through uh, Rory, some of the other countries that it has worked really well in uh, best the biggest impact and the, also some of the worst case scenarios as well of uh, delivering change. Um, I'm kind of thinking South Africa with its great socioeconomic rights, but at the same time, there's uh, issues there in terms of balance. I'm then going to let Sean in to ask a question. Anyone else wants to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll come to you, but I'll uh, do it. What I'll do is I'll take two at a time and uh, uh, let Rory come in then. Thanks, Rory. Yeah, thanks, Hazel. No, I think it's really important to point out that it's over 80 countries internationally have a right to housing in the constitution. So you're, you're absolutely right to say this isn't reinventing the wheel. This isn't something that 
you know, just Ireland would be doing alone. You know, there's many European countries have a right to housing, as you mentioned as well. South Africa is one of the countries that really um, progressed it. And it's, there's a number of countries which are good examples, I think, of what it has achieved. Uh, Finland is, is, is always cited in particular around homelessness. Um, and they are, of course, one of the few countries that has actually significantly reduced homelessness in recent years. And they have a very explicit right to housing in their constitution. Um, and the point is made that in, it's not the specific right itself that means, for example, people can go to court over the issue. It's more that having the right to housing in the constitution there means that all policy is around, is focused around delivering the right to housing as it's essentially it's its purpose you know there's, there's no um other real substantive purpose to the policy so it's it requires the state to act in ways to fulfill that right and finland i think is a very good example of what is achieved when you have a very clear right to housing in the constitution and they have other processes and the mercy law center have produced a report on that which you can look at and um, i can give people links to that where they explain the different processes that go along with that france is another example they introduced the right to housing in the early um mid 2000s and it has had an impact there in terms of um achieving uh, progress on housing as well thank you marie sean hi Rory. um thanks so much for your great talk uh, really really interesting um um obviously and um something I'm I'm sure everyone here is 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 really concerned about. Um, I have a question about your use of terminology, if you don't mind. I'm wondering what you're thinking about with the constitution, uh, like in a, something like this going into the constitution. We're often talking here about homelessness and the idea of a home, but then we're talking about the right to housing. So, how do you can you imagine that the term like home might turn up in something like this? So like, if it actually gets written into the constitution, will there be a concept of home in there? Will there be you know, because I, I'm concerned about, for example, that they might talk about the right for housing, but it might impact people who, you know, have, you end up with bad housing, like housing that isn't really appropriate for home, basically. So I'm wondering, what do you think, like how home might turn up in this? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Sean. Um, and I think I know what you're saying, because what we don't want to put in is some minimal right to shelter, for example. Uh, it has to be, it needs to be, um, a very substantive right that is a right to home, essentially, um, in the broadest kind of sense of what we mean. And I think the, you know, Home for Good had a lot of discussion around the wording um, and we had a legal subgroup that worked on it. And the decision was, from our perspective, was to use the UN definition of adequate housing, because in that it does essentially encapsulate what home is. So that's what those different aspects I talked about, you know, home, it's about security of tenure. So it's about somewhere someone isn't, you know, can't be arbitrarily evicted from that. It's, you know, they're secure. Um, and what we would consider that as necessarily being secure long term, you know, that's a home and um, somewhere where you can be, you know, it's, it's you don't really have security of tenure, for example, in the private rental sector where you can be evicted if the landlord is selling the property. Um, and other broader issues then of home of standards, you know, as I said, habitability is a very specific term that is in there with inadequate housing, which means housing should be of decent standard. Um, so those broader aspects of home, which I think is what you're talking about, are within that adequate housing definition. But I do think I, I do agree with you, though, it is something that we need to maybe think about more in terms of how home is brought in there. Um, and also important, the cultural adequacy part, as I said earlier, of adequate housing under the UN definition includes different versions of what is a home, um, because people, of course, have different, um, you know, approaches to what is home. Thank you, Sean and Rory. Uh, before I bring Philomena in, I guess I want to follow up on, on your point there um, on, on language, uh, Rory and on Sean's. You have written in the past about using human rights based approach to tackling housing deprivation in Dolphin House. A short hop from there is Oliver Bond, which has seen huge ongoing issues in terms of damp and housing standards. What difference to those res residents would a referendum make? Uh, we don't have agreed wording yet to, on, a, uh, on the amendment. What needs to be included to ensure we can help those people too that 
the right is strong and as broad as possible. So again, I guess that's why I want to bring it in there with yourself and Sean talking about language. Uh, I, I would like, I guess, having read what you've written in the past um, on human rights of approach, how would you uh, word that amendment to, to, to encapsulate that? Right. Rory? Oh no, did we lose Rory? Hello? Okay, everyone else can hear me, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, Rory has now gone. Christ, I thought we were a pretty good host, no? <laughs> Let's bring him back. Hang on. I'm going to ask Oliver to bring him back. One second, folks. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Apologies about that, my computer died. I just want to get the battery, oh. sorry. In fairness, there was a pretty good picture of you looking kind of like, <laughs> uh, for, for a good like one minute before I coughed that you weren't there anymore. Um, sorry, I don't George, know. you were asking about the, the Oliver Bond situation. Yeah, I was I was asking about Oliver Bond and, and a piece you've written about uh, human base, human rights based approach to tackling mm -hmm. houses and deprivation in, in Dolphin House. And for those who don't know the area, there, there's a huge uh, um, issue with housing and housing standards there. So I I guess for me, it's, um, it's finding out how for you in your mind, looking at the language of this amendment, because you and Sean just talk, uh, talked about the importance of language. Uh, how do we, well, we, we don't have an agreed wording yet on the amendment, what needs to be included to ensure we can help these people that the right is drawn as broad as possible in your mind. Yeah, again, I, I think that, you know, as you said, I, I worked in, in Dolphin's Barn uh, for many years on the whole issue of substandard housing, the issue of mold and damp in, in local authority housing um, and trying to progress that and working with the community. And we took a human rights based approach. Um, and we know that across this country, there are tenants both in private rental and in social housing who are living in substandard conditions um, affected by mold, damp. Um, and firstly, in terms of local authority and social housing, what I was really struck by working there was how the language of human rights itself um, and tenants realizing that they actually had a right to housing meant something very, very significant to them. Uh, prior to the work we were doing and the education work we were doing with them, there was a whole issue of them feeling responsible themselves for causing issues. And there was, you know, sometimes the council would blame them for causing dampness in the, in the flat. Um, whereas in, in the right to housing and what putting it in the constitution would mean is that people whose rights have been violated um, would hopefully, and, and through the process of the referendum as well, they would see that they do that the, the government the state has an obligation a very clear obligation to ensure that their right to housing is met and it has to work to to do that and that they don't have to live in dampness or in you know substandard conditions nobody should be living in substandard conditions in one of the most wealthiest countries in the world and that is a basic human right and we should be working to ensure people aren't doing that. So what this would mean is number one, is they would hopefully through this whole process, um, they would see that they do have a right to housing, which, and as I said earlier, the UN definition of adequate housing and what we put that wording, proposed wording there of adequate includes decent standard. So mold and damp, you know, they would be um, violations of the right to housing um, if they're not being addressed. And um, so it would, both require the state to act and then potentially yes there are potential for court cases as well around it um, and then there's a whole question of that is the question on the courts and what role they play there is no expectation that 
if a right to housing was put in the constitution that there would be this flood of court cases um, and the legal scholars have said that. But on the other hand, if um, tenants were uh, not their, you know, substandard conditions like Oliver Bond, there could be a case for bringing that forward. And I think that would be the right thing to do. And the state would have to answer that. Yeah, thanks, Rory. Philomena, and then I'll bring in Michael and go back to Rory. Philomena? Hi, Rory. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. I'm just wondering, um, for the over 80 countries with a right to housing, I'm wondering, was there any negative or unanticipated side effects to bringing in the right to housing in the Constitution? Yeah, thanks for that, Philomena. I think that, and again, uh, Professor Okaneda would have more expertise in terms of that international experience than myself but he and he made the point because he was asked that at the iraq hearing and what he made the point was that the really the biggest issue is that expectations weren't were raised of by people that in terms of you know this right to housing was passed and then people would have you know they would have their right to housing fulfilled it wasn't so people were let down and had a sense mm -hmm. of let down of being let down and the real issue was that essentially the right to housing didn't achieve um, kind of what people had hoped it would. So it's more that really the right to housing didn't achieve what it could have or what people thought it would have, rather than, you know, causing sort of, as you, people would refer to, unintended consequences legally, that really the biggest issue was um, it didn't deliver. And, and that's because, you know, putting the right to housing in the constitution in and of itself is not going to do anything that it requires legislation, it requires investment to actually be, you know, actioned. And so that is kind of the, the work that will have to continue. Um, hopefully when the referendum is passed, that that is, you know, the, it's part of the journey and not. So that, that, is, that was kind of the point he made, that that was kind of the biggest. There, there's potential for, um, so would argue for a diversion of resources um, into, for example, legal cases. Um, and, you know, you can see, for example, in education, um, the state does have to, is, you know, being brought to court in relation to cases, legal cases. Um, and some would argue that that would be a diversion of resources. Um, but I would argue that, 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 that whatever diversion of resources would take place, it would be a price worth paying in terms of making the state overall accountable and responsible for what it needs to do in terms of housing. Thank you. Thanks, Rory. Thanks for me. And Michael? Um, hi, Rory. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, I'm just very interested in the right housing. And one of the things that kind of concerns me is the wh whether or not there's a political will uh, among some of the big parties, especially um, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, to actually get this through um in the way that it'll actually have, take a you know have a proper effect and just the dangers i'd be thinking of is what sort of like could the wording be changed somewhat to like i mean i'm just trying to i i find it hard to see any party actually campaigning against a right to housing but uh, my worry would be maybe they would try and uh change the wording so it doesn't really have a huge effect and just from just the last few years like just the fact that we seem to be pursuing constantly coming up with these crazy policies that like are investor led and just you know um then being rolled back or phased out because they're not working and you know they're not going to work like co-living we've had built to rent we've had leasing for 30 years shared equity just the list goes on and, and they always seem to be you know pushing the prices making sure those prices keep high or, or sorry, and it, i think that's a huge issue apart uh, in the right housing that it has to be affordable and secure like for example I just don't understand why like um, bill to rent is pursued over cost rental would clearly cost rental was a much better long term secure uh, affordable housing for people in a home and the other thing as well is just even the urgency of the situation at the moment because we're in a, it is a housing emergency and a crisis and like the government rolled back on, in those 2020 measures on the um, you know the evictions and like we did see the benefits of that time when when there were you know the reduction in homelessness and evictions and all that and is there something the government really could do even now to um you know while we wait around for a referendum because as far as i think there, i just don't know why we're waiting so long for this you know to but anyway that's, that's me. yeah I, I agree with all of what you're saying i feel the same and i know a lot of people do as well why are we waiting around you know and 
the referendum, I, I think I would be worried as well. I think in terms of, um, there's a number of steps to come in, ter in, get, in terms of getting the referendum and getting a right to housing as the wording um, and a substantive, uh, meaningful right to housing. So I think you're right to, to be concerned. And um, I think that there, I know that there, there's work that will be needed to keep pressure on both in the public um, debate and, you know, in terms of speaking to politicians within government um, and convincing them that, you know, what people want is actually a right to housing and that people won't be, um, they won't be fooled by some sort of uh, minimal standard wording that does, isn't really significant or meaningful. And I think really the big parties have to understand that, um, that, that, that it's the right to housing ref wording that needs to go in there and that's what people want. And so this consultation is really important, I think, for that in terms of people putting that forward. Um, and then we're going to have to see what wording comes from the Housing Commission. And hopefully it is, if it is a right to housing, that then that would be, that will have to go to a Rockdis committee and that will be discussed. So I think it is about building momentum in the public um, and among civil society groups and political parties and saying that we want this to be a right to housing referendum. And there is lots of other things that could be done alongside this. And um, in particular, I think, you know, there could be a moratorium uh, even on a temporary basis introduced for uh, rent freezes and for um, uh, moratorium on evictions, even for a year or two years. Um, and we, of course, have the budget coming up. And I think there's a, a real need to increase investment um, in social and affordable housing even further and setting up, as I've argued, a state construction company as well. So there are things I think that can be done alongside this. Thanks, Rory. Karen? Thanks, Rory. That was really, really interesting. And I completely agree. We need to hold firm on the wording and get it as strong as possible, because what's going to come out of this is legislation. And the stronger that that wording is, then, you know, the stronger the legislation can be in terms of setting those standards that we, we spoke about, particularly in local authority uh, and social housing. Um, I have a question, and it, it doesn't concern a huge group of people, but um, myself and Joe got it on the doors and we were canvassing. It'll be a dead giveaway. We're in quite an OK constituency. Um, it's more for the likes of what we would call them the accidental landlords. You know, somebody who maybe bought a small property on their own during the boom um, and then they got married, needed to, to move to have children or to have space for children and now are faced with it's a property that's in negative equity and they can't sell it um, or people who inherit um, family homes that need a lot of work before they're, they're rented out. That's, I think we need to do a lot to bring them on board and kind of show them that this referendum and, and subsequent legislation, we're not out to, um, for want of a better word, to get people who, who are in that situation. We just want practical, safe, affordable housing for everyone in terms of tenure, in terms of, of, of whether renting or purchasing. So do you think there needs to be a bit done in relation to that cohort? Yeah, thanks, Karen. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. And I think we, you know, the, the concern, I do have a concern and I know others in Home for Good have it as well, that, you know, if, <laughs> part of the need to progress both wording um, as soon as possible but broader we need to have you know answers to those and we need to be looking like in, in marriage equality um, and the repeal campaign at different groups who might be against this or who, who are more likely to be against this and how do we answer the genuine fears and concerns people have um, and I think that, so there, there is work needs to be done and in that group in particular I think the the accidental landlord you know when you look at people like that it, they are, you know, it's about I think having a conversation with with those and saying, look, this is not going to impact on on your um, terms of property. That it might impact, for example, in saying that you know you can't evict a tenant when selling the property if there's a tenant in place, but you can still sell your property. Um, and I think what the state, what this would mean is the state would be more obliged, for example, to you know if you couldn't sell the property to buy the property. Um, if, for example, you were looking to, as you say, do it up in terms of to, to rent it out, the state should be providing funding that, you know, to housing to ensure it's brought into use. Um, and so it is about, um, I think, ensuring more and more housing is brought into use 
more of our land, more of our vacant buildings. But on the other side as well, I think there, within the com- we do need to have a conversation as a country and say, look, you know, our approach to property during the Celtic Tiger was just bonkers. Like it was just wrong. And the absolutely idea, nuts, <laughs> nuts, like completely. And the idea that you could just make money from property is just bonkers. Like, and this is why we're in this. And I think a lot of people, when you have that conversation, they go, yeah, you're, you're right. You know, we shouldn't be able to make a whole pile of money. And if you, you know, you make this investment, you know, we should be treating housing as this investment where you, you expect this huge rate of return. Um, you know, we need, people need homes and that's the way you work it. And, and I think that part of that conversation would both ease their fears and I think help them understand, you know, as well, that housing is not something that you can, you should be expecting to make this massive profit from. Thanks, Karen. Louise, and then Magic. Louise? Hi, thanks a million for the, uh, the talk. I'm just wondering, um, do we need a simple th- thing to get this through the referendum to get the right, or can we skew it so it, it, it impacts on dereliction and reusing existing properties? And also, sorry, second question, um, how is it going to impact on local authorities? Yeah, so on the dereliction and vacancy, I would think that if you put a right to housing in the constitution, it would make it very clear that the point is your housing system, the government is then obliged to ensure that our housing system delivers the right to housing. So if you have this situation where you have 166,000 vacant homes and we we actually don't know how many derelict properties there are, there are 40,000 plus, probably even, you know, multiples of that across up and down the country that, you know, a government can't, that's not fulfilling the right to housing. And so therefore the government is required to take even more action on those. And in the cases, because we do know that there are situations where property is just sitting there because either an owner is not interested or doesn't have the money, but still thinks, well, it's my property. I can do whatever I want with it. And there needs to be an understanding that, well, property is, um, you can own property, but it shouldn't be at the expense of other people uh, being able to access a home in that sense of you can have multiple properties, decide whatever you want to do with them, and um, that there is this balancing of a right to a home. Um, and so I think that that's where it would really provide very clear guidance for government that it has to tackle vacancy and dereliction um, on a major scale. And in terms of local authorities, again, I mentioned this earlier, it would be very clear all state policy um, would have to be reviewed, housing policy would have to be reviewed for how it's delivering and meeting the right to housing. And that would include local authorities across the board. And that would be a lot of work and it would be a lot of, um, it would, I think, require significant change in culture, in practice, in how local authorities operate. Um, but that, I think, is what's needed. Last question from Matthew. Hi, how's it going? Uh, I was just wondering in relation to how would securing the right to housing in the constitution tackle um, the actual reducing the cost of building housing and and building homes in, in the country itself, like how what's the follow through from getting the right of housing into the constitution and actually building like building homes and building properties for affordable affordable prices that people can then purchase for themselves or that local authorities that can build and then rent out at an affordable rate yeah no that it's a really important one and and i think that again this comes down to that we need to you know convince you know the generation locked out of homes that you know this will make a difference um it can make a difference um And the way I would see that happening as if you put a right to housing in your constitution, first of all, as a process in the referendum itself, there would be major public debate across the country um, across generations about how we treat housing, about what role government has, about what role the market has, about this idea that housing is a human right. And because there is a lot of ideas around and you hear it like saying, oh, you know, millennials and, and younger are just, you know, spend too much money on whatever Netflix or avocado toast. And that's why they can't afford a home. And, you know, back in my day, I was able to afford one. And why don't they just yeah. save more? And, you know, th- this real idea that it's like it's your individual responsibility to get yourself a home and, you know, and not actually understanding that our housing system now and market has become so unaffordable. Um, and there's all sorts of multiple issues that you know explain why 
uh, we have this massive collapse in home ownership rate. And at the heart of it is the way house prices have risen so much over the last two decades um, and that um, way housing has been commodified and financialized. And so I think what this is about is it comes back to us saying that, well, we will do whatever we can government to make housing more affordable. And there is ways that that can be done. And, and it does, it will mean, I think it should mean that the state does have more of a role in delivering housing. Um, and that is where it comes to, you put the right to housing in the constitution, then government has to, as I say, look at its policies and say, well, how are we delivering that? And so there will be debate about that. There will be discussion about it. But I would argue that it would require, it would mean government would be required to build more affordable housing. Um, and to look at things, like I said, you know, perhaps a state construction company, but that's all, you know, that all depends on what decisions are made. Um, but I think in terms of housing affordability, it would be, you know, it, as I said, it's about changing our whole housing system to yeah. meet the right to housing, which is affordable housing, secure tenure. So I think it would make a substantial shift on many, many levels. Um, and even in terms of what private developers and investors think they can just do with housing, that yeah. they would have to respect the right to housing as well, um, which may, might mean less profits, but that should then mean more affordable housing. But again, yeah. that's, you know, it's, we know that housing has become so expensive because it has been handed over to the market. Land prices are so high, they're a major factor in the cost of housing. You know, we look at materials now have increased, um, but financing housing, for example, is very expensive as well. And there are ways the state can provide affordable land, uh, affordable finance to mm. private, de private developers and builders that can make housing more affordable. Um, overall, I think it is about us understanding fundamentally that we have to ensure the right to housing for people. And that means the state has to deliver on housing policy on a much, much more serious way, I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Karen has a quick follow up, but well, I just want to refer everyone to the, uh, I posted a link. I know uh, Marie's going to send around a presentation, but for people who want to provide their views to the uh, housing commission the end date is in september and there's a number of ways you can submit but i do encourage people to provide a submission if they can uh, by friday the second of september on what this amendment should look like so i have uh, karen as a quick follow-up and then i'm going to wrap up here thanks hazel just um on what matthew was asking around how this would actually look i'm speaking from personal experience i grew up in social housing in the north um, and I've seen where it has worked well. So um, would you see it as a similar system to up there whereby each local authority has their own construction division department and they are responsible for constructing social and affordable housing? So in the instance of my own experience, my parents rented um, from the local authority and then they were given, once their rent had paid off the construction costs, they were given the option to buy. If you decide not to buy you're not discriminated against you're allowed to continue living on in the property paying the same rent um my parents did opt to buy but they paid i think around nine thousand pounds for it in the early 2000s i've seen it work very well up in the north where they have as i mentioned each local authority has their own construction department is that what you would kind of see as with maybe a national construction body yeah, no, that's it, it's slightly out of the, 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 the referendum in that, you know, a referendum wouldn't, you know, necessitate us making, you know, that clear a policy definition, you know, separate from the referendum. I think that there should be a, a state construction company. Um, I think that both local authorities and housing bodies, housing associations um, need to be given much more capacity. Um, and funding to build um, and to develop housing and that they would draw on then and contract in a state construction company to build it. That would be my view of how it could be done. But, you know, there are other views on that. I think what's most important is that we do actually develop a capacity to both develop housing um, and to construct it as well within the public sector. Um, be that, uh, I think, you know, a semi-state enterprise um, like the ESB, I think is necessary, particularly when you look at the need for retrofitting as well, uh, the capacity to build up skills through that, 
um, and the massive scale that's required in terms of retrofitting and building sustainable homes. Um, I think that relying on the market and the private sector is just, it's absurd given the, the housing need that is there and um, over it being completely dependent on it. I mean, of course the private sector has a role. And um, so therefore I would see setting up a state construction company and setting up development capacity amongst local authorities supported by the land development agency as well. I think there's a, a potential for that um, and particularly regionally as well. And then, as I said, housing not for profit, housing bodies as well, like the Okulon uh, Co-Housing Alliance, like, you know, Clued, Respond, those bodies. Um, I think overall it's about us understanding that the non-market sector of housing needs a much, much greater role. Like it's scandalous that you've, you know, situations where, you know, we have huge amount of land, public land available. Um, you know, there's communities I know around the country who are interested in developing sustainable co-housing, not being supported. Um, you know, housing associations say they could do more if they had more land. So I think it's really about um, putting that onus on the state to do everything it can to address the housing uh, crisis, the housing emergency. And just to follow up on that, there's a huge element of local government reform here as well that needs to happen with mm -hmm. the, the, the policy uh, drives is because each local authority will give you different reasons on why they won't build. But if you look at Dublin alone and stand on that junction of St. Patrick's Cathedral and Ivy Trust, there are three corners there that are all public housing. Mm -hmm. And we have been able to build those public housing up until two decades ago. So we can do it, but there's no will to do it. And having a national uh, building agency will help drive that and, have no, and don't leave local authorities with any more excuses of not being able to build. So, so I think that that would be important in the grander scheme of things. Anyway, on that um, more operational note, I'd like to thank uh, Rory for coming in to speak to us on uh, the uh, housing referendum. And um, as I linked to the uh, um, information on the chat box there, please do submit your um, it, it, please do submit any thoughts or your or, or opinions on what the amendment should be. And if you have any questions about this session, um, please come back to us. And Rory has uh, has his slides that he can send away around to every one of us. Again, thank you so much for coming and uh, thank you for uh, for getting involved. So thanks, thanks again. Hazel. Thank thanks, you. Both. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Roy. Thank you.